So, um, my name is William. Uh, I work for the Open Source Robotics Foundation. I work on ROS primarily with Dirk, Tully, and Esteve. Um, in the last couple of months, we've been working on uh, on the, our ROS2 prototypes, and uh, Dirk talked a little bit about this earlier this morning. Um, but I wanted to sort of give an overview, try to make more concrete what, what we're talking about when we say ROS 2.0, like what are some of the changes to the API that we feel we need to make, and what other parts of the system do we imagine can be better, and how. Um, so I saw a lot of people taking pictures of slides when they thought they were interesting. Just take, just get the slides. Don't, don't seem silly. So if, if you guys want to get the QR code or copy the thing there, uh, this will be at the end of the presentation as well. Um, so first of all, what is ROS2? And again, Dirk covered some of these things already. Um, I think the first thing to realize is that ROS2 is, it's not going to break ROS1, and ROS1 is going to continue to be there. Indigo is supported for five years, uh, and we're going to have future releases of ROS1 in the meantime while we're working on ROS2. Um, and ROS2 is sort of our opportunity to look to the future and see what we, how we can make it better so that when you realize you want something better, it's there for you to use it. Uh, it's too late to start building it when you realize you want it, so we're starting now. Um, that being said, we are breaking the API with ROS1. There are some issues with the way ROS1's API works, especially in C++ and Python, uh, that, uh, that we have to break the API to fix correctly. Um, but conceptually, it's very similar. We're not changing the entire game. You still have nodes, publishers, subscribers, and things like that. But mostly, it's a chance for us to reevaluate um, our dependencies and some design decisions, fix some fundamental problems. Um, it will interoperate with ROS1 to make transition easier, to let people try it out without, uh, without committing wholesale to it. It'll probably be through some kind of a bridge mechanism, though. Uh, we're going to continue using ROS1's message IDL, uh, which should be familiar to users and help us keep in sync with ROS1 in terms of messages. Uh, we're wholly embracing C++11 and Python 3, uh, which means that those are going to be requirements to use ROS2. Um, but it also means that we can drop some dependencies and things like that. Like, so far we haven't used Boost at all, which is pretty nice. Uh, there's all kinds of other nice things about C++11. I highly encourage you to look into it if you haven't. Um, we're just going to have a full-featured C API. Uh, the idea here is that we can uh, support uh, client libraries and other languages more easily and get more consistent results because I'm sure if any of you ever use ROS Pi or ROS Java as alongside ROS CPP, there are many subtle differences, which can be annoying. Um, we're going to use DDS as the middleware, um, and we're going to be aiming for real time and embedded and Windows support in addition to OSX and Linux, like we've traditionally done. Uh, it's built on top of standards, which makes it reproducible by other people, makes it more palatable for um, mission critical situations and companies and things like that. Uh, it's going to be awesome. So, um, so what, what have we done so far? So. Like I said, we're using DDS as the middleware. Uh, we're going to be able to switch DDS vendors um, as a matter of design of the system, uh, the reference implementation. Uh, so that was a big issue about licensing and which we will pick for there to be the fault. And you know, uh, we want to make it so that people can use what makes most sense for them. Um, and we're going to continue to use the message files, like I said. So existing, what can you do with the existing prototype that we have? Um, you can create nodes and publishers and subscribers, and we have wall timers and wall rates, which is enough to implement basically talker and listener for a couple different scenarios, uh, which I'll show some of today. Um, you can switch vendors at link time. A lot of this Dirk already covered. Um, something I'll be talking more about is um, uh, I'll be showing you how the changes in the API we want to make support having multiple nodes in a single process easier. So nodelets are sort of... Uh, sort of uh, implemented on top of the existing ROS implementation and provide sort of pseudo nodes, and they're not really first class citizens, and we want to make that different. We want nodes to be uh, the first class uh, interface both for running multiple nodes in a single process or one node alone by itself in a process, and hopefully in doing that improve the way you do concurrency. And there are examples on ROS2 slash examples if you want to look and see. Um, so I'm going to talk about, I'm going to jump right into the code, because I think most people are interested, at least when I'm looking at a new project, I like to see what the code's going to look like uh, to start with, but uh, I'm going to show a talker example, and then I'm going to show a listener example, 
uh, in a different style. Um, and I'm going to talk about how we want to improve the Node-Lit style of developing nodes um, so you can write more efficient code out of the box. Um, and drill down into that a little bit to give you some detail, a good example of why we want to change it and what are the technical reasons behind that. And then I'm um, going to talk about some other high-level features that we want to change that are on the horizon. So this, this, is, this is code that compiles in our example, for the most part, some small changes to make the code fit on the screen. Um, in, this, in this situation, we're inheriting from Node and uh, doing all our work in a class-based system. You can see here there's no spin uh, because the idea is that you create this, make a library out of it, and then we run the execution for you, which you get a lot of features for, and we'll talk about more later. But some things to notice here, uh, inherits from node. Um, when you create the node, you delegate the name of your node to, uh, to the constructor of the node. Um, it'll still support the idea of ROS name, so you can change the name of the node from the command line or from your launch file, but the way you set the default value will be through the constructor of the, of the node class. Uh, we're using C++ all over the place, some cool things on this page. Uh, User-defined literals, so you can create a timer with hertz or seconds to define a rate or a period respectively. It's no longer ambiguous what the value there is. Um, we're using auto wherever it makes sense, and we're using uh, things that used to be provided by Boost, which we now have in the standard library, like shared pointers. So you look at the class design, you're like, well, that doesn't work in all situations. I'm you know, integrating with another system with an event loop, or I'm you know, doing a driver, or I have some other special case, or I just prefer this method. You can still do that. So uh, in, this, in this example, I have uh, 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 one of the examples from our examples repository of, a, um, of, a, of the listener, hello world sort of uh, thing that's in the ROS tutorials. And then in the comments, I have the ROS1 equivalent each of those lines. So you can see that the callback is really similar, um, the basically identical. Um, and here we're using the logging macro in ROS. We'll have the same thing in the new one, I just don't have it yet. So I'm using standard IO for this now, um, or IO stream. Uh, you can see that uh, the next important fact is that the node's name, instead of being passed to a global function, is passed to the constructor of the node. So this is a very subtle but important difference that allows us to more easily and transparently have more than one node in a single process without doing any uh, shenanigans that the nodelets have to do to accomplish that. So that's a very important transition. And then you can see we create a subscriber in very similar fashion, some different names and stuff. These aren't all set in stone yet. Um, I mean, sort of bike shed stuff that we can discuss later. but. Um, you, you basically give your topic name, a queue size, and a callback to call when you get a new message. It's all relatively similar to ROS1. Another big difference here is that uh, spin is called on the node as opposed to globally with no parameters. Again, spin here was relying on implicit global state about your node, which is no longer exists. Um, so. You can see it's a pretty subtle, subtle difference. The, the biggest point I'm trying to point, here, point out here, the, the most evident change from the simple hello world examples here is that globes are no longer, uh, I'm sorry, no, nodes are no longer global. Uh, and and that's, that's important for a few ways, uh, in a few ways. So uh, mostly in the way that the idea of nodelets manifests itself in ROS2. So I talked about some of these things already. There's, uh, you know, no global state tracking nodes. Um, uh, this is why you have to pass it to spin. Um, there won't be any difference between nodes and nodelets. One of the big problems with nodes and nodelets was that they had subtly different APIs so that if you wanted to make the decision whether your code ran in its own process or shared a process with other nodes was a decision you had to make at the time you're writing your code. Uh, and we want to try to avoid that as much as possible in the future so you can make that decision at runtime instead at configuration time of your system. Um, so um, so how, do, how does this make these better? So, so as soon as you have this concept that I can run multiple nodes in the same process, you can begin to do some really interesting things. You can do things like thread pooling, where you, uh, you allow many different nodes which are completely decoupled from each other to share execution resources, which can be much more efficient. 
um, than especially than having them all in separate processes, but also even more, even more efficient than having a thread for each of them. Um, you can also do things like passing shared pointers around instead of using uh, DDS or whatever, the underlying implementation of the middleware to transmit between processes, IPC, um, which can be a huge win, especially for pipelines involving images or 3D data, stuff like that. Um, and Nodelitz provided most of this functionality, but they had some, some drawbacks. Um, and a few of them were that the APIs were different between the nodes and the Nodelitz. Uh, and that uh, creating and running nodelets was a little bit complicated and different, uh, notably different than how you create and write and run nodes, uh, regular nodes. Um, and there were some problems with the way concurrency was handled in nodelets, which led, can lead to either starvation of the thread pool threads, uh, starvation of the people who want to use them due to them being locked up, or uh, it led to everyone using their own thread, which is also not very efficient. So. So how, how are we trying to address the, the issue of the APIs being different? And, and the, basic, the basic point is we move the, uh, all the global state that used to be about nodes out of, out of the global state and into being owned by the node class, um, which basically allows you, whether you create a node and then call functions on it, or you subclass from a node and call functions on yourself, on your base class, uh, the API is the same and the behavior is the same. Um, so. It allows you to write both the procedural and component style APIs. Um, so how about making it easier? So to make it easier, uh, the preliminary idea is to have a, a CMake macro where you can define the name of your node, any source code for that node, and any other compile options you need. And this will do three things. It will create for you a library, which is a shared library, uh, which contains the implementation of your node. Uh, and this is to support it being used sort of like a plugin, which can be dynamically loaded if it needs to, needs to be. It also creates an executable for your node, where if you run the executable for the node, it will just run that node in its own process, like you would, you would expect if you had implemented your own main. Um, but you can optionally pass it some arguments, which will cause it to be dynamically loaded into a process with other nodes and run there. And uh, this, then this executable will serve as sort of a proxy it'll remain running while the remote thing is executing it, and whether when it ends naturally or you know, fatally uh, through like a seg fault or something, then, then your, your executable will end. That, this is a similar pattern to how nodelets work so that you have some sort of proxy object to represent the thing that's running somewhere else. Um, but either way, you have this executable which is sort of the single point of entry for your, for your node, which is a little bit easier to deal with. It makes it easier to build it and then test it on your own and then easily, you know, then throw it in a launch file and have it run with other nodes in a single process. So I don't want to spend too much time on this. I, I hope I can make it clear why, why this is a problem and how we're going to try to address it. Um, basically, when you created a nodelet in ROS1, you, you have to either choose between a multi-threaded node handle or a single-threaded node handle. If you choose a multi-threaded node handle, um, your callbacks, it's sort of like creating an async spinner with a value not one, meaning that your callbacks can get called uh, at the same time in different threads, uh, even re-entrantly. Uh, you can have multiple instances of the same callback being called at the same time. Um, and when it did that, it would share a, a pool of threads amongst all nodelets which did that. Uh, if you select a single-threaded node handle, then you get a um, you get your own thread, and it behaves like a normal ROS node where you just call spin. Every callback in your node is executed. You're guaranteed that they're going to be mutually exclusively ex uh, executed, um, so you don't have to worry about thread safety. Um, so the problem with nodelets is that is that if you have a multi-threaded nodelet. Uh, and you have a callback that's not reentrant, that's accessing shared data, you will usually lock it so that if other instances of that same callback try to get run at the same time, only one does it at a time. The problem with this is, is that in this, like in this example here, um, you've got uh, a node with two callbacks and then another node with a single callback. You have two threads in your thread pool. Um, you could have two instances of the first one. Uh, the first instance is executing, holding a lock, and the second one's waiting on that lock. So you could be running callback two of node one or callback one of node two in that second thread, but you can't because it's just being wasted. 
Um, so to prevent this, and, and this is really bad because node two is getting starved because of the behavior of node one, which really sucks. So what happens is if in node two you want to avoid this, typically you create a single threaded node handle, you get your own thread. But that's not really great because having many, many threads you know, increases your memory footprint and it makes context switching less efficient. Um, so we've introduced this concept in ROS2, which is a totally optional concept, but I think is a really neat concept, um, which we're calling callback groups. And callback groups basically are a grouping of anything with callbacks. That includes sub subscriptions, uh, service handlers, um, timers, and things like that. And uh, there's two types of callback groups. There's mutually exclusive callback groups and reentrant callback groups. Um, a reentrant callback group, uh, basically any callback that's in a reentrant callback group has to, has to say, you're, you're basically saying this callback can be called at the same time as itself and the same time as any other callbacks in this group. If, uh, if your group, if your callback is in a mutually exclusive callback group, uh, you're basically saying my callback is not reentrant and it's also not thread safe with any other callbacks in this, um, in this group. And that's basically the default behavior for a ROS node where you have, you just call normal spin. You create, say, two different subscribers. Uh, you can access shared resources in each of the callbacks for that subscriber, those subscribers because you can guarantee they're not going to get called at the same time because they're always getting called in the same thread. Um, and so th basically this concept needs to be introduced because we're decoupling uh, the code uh, that determines what you're doing in your callbacks and the code which executes them. So when you were calling spin or calling async spinner, you were controlling how those got executed. So basically you're adding some concurrency information to your callbacks. And so this helps us in that example I talked about. You can put the callbacks for node one in a mutually exclusive callback group and now the system that's executing all of the callbacks for all the different nodes is smart enough to know that even though node one callback one could be executed, it's not eligible because it's already executing an instance of it. And what that does is it allows us to uh, prevent them being called back at, or run at the same time without using locks, which is a lot more efficient and allows you uh, better concurrency uh, when sharing amongst threads. So that's, I think that's a really cool idea. Hopefully it wasn't too too technically detailed, um, but so so okay. We're going to improve nodelets. Why does that Why does that help us? As soon as we get people doing this as the default, or at least making it easier so people can choose to do it uh, from the get go, you can take advantage of, like I said before, thread pooling, uh, passing smart pointers instead of doing IPC between processes, which can be slow. Um, it also comes up allows you to think about some new ideas. Uh, this one is sort of half baked. I sort of came up with. So it's not fully thought through. But the idea is that you can create sort of a pipeline where you have an input topic and an output topic of the same type and a callback. And so what happens is, is that some other person publishes a message and the system gives you a unique pointer of that message. And for those of you who aren't versed in C++11 terminology, a unique pointer is basically a scope pointer, meaning that it's an object that points to something in memory and when that object goes out of reference, it automatically, automatically deletes that object. Um, but the other neat trick about them is, is that you can transfer ownership. So if you assign a unique pointer to another unique pointer, the pointer you're assigning from becomes invalid and the one you're assigning to becomes valid. And so in this way, you can pass ownership of something. So before the callback's executed, the system owns, has ownership of the message. And then when the callback starts executing, the ownership is owned by the callback. The callback can mutate the message and then return the ownership to the system, and then the system will publish it for you to the outgoing topic. And in this way, you can actually have several of these chained together and never copy the message. Even in the shared pointer system that Nodelets has, you receive callbacks of a const type. So in order to modify it and republish it, you need to copy it first. So that's not, like I said, I haven't really thought it through all the way, but it seems like something that you could start doing, which is really awesome. Um, so I just wanted to stop and see where we were. So that was. That was pretty in depth. I'm going to be a little bit more high level on the last two things here. So we're, we're, we're right here. We're going to talk about dynamic graph features. So one other really cool thing that we've run into several times people wanted and systems were trying to design on top of ROS where this would be really awesome is the idea of remapping or aliasing topics at runtime. So the idea for remapping is you say, I want the camera topic to now be left camera for this node. And so any publishers or subscribers that had for that topic camera will now be left camera. 
And if it had any connections established with camera, it would disconnect those and establish new connections for left camera. A similar idea is aliasing when you say, I want camera to be also left camera, meaning that if it had connections with camera, it would keep them, and then any, uh, and it would establish new connections additionally for left camera, uh, which is a kind of a cool idea, which, which, um, which is similar to uh, sort of, uh, there's this, this project with Eugen called uh, uh, Robots in Concert, where they have this idea of exposing topics. So you have like an internal name for the topic that nobody can see, and then you can choose to expose it in a namespace, which I think will be a feature that might be useful in multi-robot systems. So if you want to expose the command velocity for a robot, on the robot it's called command velocity, but you can also expose it to a different part of the system under a different name. And that's completely transparent to the code you write. You're still just publishing to one thing and receiving from one thing. Um, so to accomplish this, basically we would use, you know, nodes would have a default set of uh, so services which uh, allowed an external system to modify the nodes at runtime. Um, this might apply, currently I'm just thinking about for publishers and subscribers, but obviously it extends somewhat logically to services and parameters. Um, and so I think, I think it would be useful for development tools and multi-robot systems. So an example of a developer tool that might benefit from this is RQT graph. You can imagine an RQT graph where you're looking at your graphs and your, or your nodes in your graph and the topics they're talking to, and you can see, oh, I forgot to remap this topic on this node. You can simply select the topic you want to remap and which topic you want to remap it to, and it just does it. Uh, and then it, and when you're done, you can say, give me a configuration diff, which will allow me to apply this to my you know, launch configuration. So I think that's a really powerful feature. Um, the, other, the other concept that we've always been talking about with ROS2, and we've been thinking about in more detail recently, is the, the lifecycle management of nodes. So we heard about this a little bit with, uh, with ROS control, and we're hoping to um, make some of these features first class in ROS2 um, so that it can be reused in things like ROS control. Um, but the idea is that uh, in ROS1, you basically have launch files, and you launch it, and if something didn't work, you close all of them and try it again. Uh, or if you want to know if your robot's ready, it's typically like you look for like something to happen on the robot, or you look at some kind of leaf output topic, and you hope data's coming out of that. And not, then you have to really dig in. Uh, and so there, the, the point I'm getting at is there's no real way to know once you've run a launch file, when it's ready, or when it's running, or if it's got a problem, or if it's all connected, or what. So uh, a case study of this is, is the capabilities system, which is in ROS1. Uh, if any of you are interested, it's, got, it's on wiki.ros.org capabilities. Um, but this system is basically allows you to define capabilities for a robot, like navigation, or pick and place, or something like that. And these are basically defined by an interface and a launch file which implement them. And the interface is defined in terms of like ROS topics and parameters and services and stuff. Um, but uh, there are a lot of situations where it would be really not, there's a lot of race conditions basically introduced where when you launch these things, the thing that requested for them to be launched has no idea when they're actually finished launching. Um, and this is especially annoying in like unit tests because I'd like to start these things and then shut them down again and see that there were no exceptions thrown, but I don't know when I can call stop because I don't know when it started fully. So like, there, there's this problem of not being able to uh, get events about the state of your system and to get aggregate uh, values for the state of your system, which I think would be really valuable, especially in products and uh, reliable systems. So, so this comes to the idea of a verifiable system. So. Um, you know, you, you basically, if a node misbehaves, you just, in ROS1, you just restart it or crash the whole thing and look into it. Um, in ROS2, we're looking at uh, adopting a component lifecycle as an optional thing that you build on top of the basic node API. Uh, and we're looking at, like, Oracos's RTT, uh, OMG, which does DDS, also has a standard called RTC, which is implemented in OpenRTM, uh, which is pushed mostly by uh, AIST in Japan. Um, but both of these have component models that we're looking at adapting for use in ROS2. Uh, and you know, we're not really set on what the states are and everything like that, but some of the goals is we want reliable and deterministic node startup and shutdown, and we want, uh, we want to be able to introspect the state of the system. We want to be able to like, run a launch file and say, okay, is everything running? Is everything connected? Are there any topics that should have been connected that weren't? Things like this. Um, 
uh, and it should work regardless of whether you're using the Nodelet style API I talked about before or the, the you know, write your own main kind of style. Um, and it also brings up this idea of migratable. So, you know, once you have the lifecycle in place, um, you're able to not only introspect the lifecycle, but affect the lifecycle externally. And you have uh, this style of nodelets where you run nodes in, the, in, a, in a shared process. You have this idea that you could actually migrate things. So if you had, let's say you had a, a, a node running in its own process and a, a container running some other nodes and you wanted that node to be in that process, you can imagine a graphical tool which allows you to say, just move this node over there. And it changes the state of the node in its own process to stopped. Maybe it stores some configuration uh, and it uh, launches it in the other process and then restores the configuration and goes back to running. So it's like a live migratable node, which again is, is just a kind of a shiny developer tool, but it could save you a lot of time, uh, especially if you want to see what it's like, like, you know, is, what's the performance different in running a node in this process versus the other process, things like that. So that's basically I, all I had to talk about, but, in, you know, just to recap, you know, why, why should we excited about ROS2 and one of the thing, and I, I think just having a modern API with minimalized dependencies and better portability is, is a huge thing. Like we're gonna be using C++11, which is great. We're going to have much fewer dependencies. We hope to cut boost as a dependency. The current implementation only depends on a C++11 compiler and a DDS implementation, most of which don't have any dependencies themselves, um, which will make distributing something like a ROS SDK much more viable, you can, you know, you can, and shipping things for exotic hardware and stuff like that, pre-compiled binaries for that, makes it more uh, tractable problem. You're gonna get some benefits from DDS right out of the box. Um, Dirk talked about a bunch of these. The ones that I think are awesome are UDP multicast uh, is automatic uh, when, it, when it sees that as an advantage. Uh, they all, some of them also have options for uh, secure con communication, encryption over TLS, over TCP, TCP IP. Um, it allows us to do masterless discovery, um, things like this. We're gonna get a lot of benefit from this and we're gonna be able to spend more of our developer time on the robot specific features, which I think will be great. Um, we're gonna try to make it easier to work with multiple nodes in the same process, which I think is going to allow people to write much more efficient code, especially for like image processing algorithms and things like that. And they're gonna be first class citizens. There's not gonna be any differentiation between them and nodes in their own process in terms of introspectability or API or anything like that. Um, we're gonna have some more dynamic runtime features, uh, lifecycle management, and so many other things we haven't had time to cover here or not fully, uh, we've not really discussed in a design way, things like dynamic parameters. Most, I think most ROS, I think the idea is that ROS parameters will all be dynamic uh, and owned by nodes. So be, we'll, we'll remove the schism between ROS parameters and dynamic reconfigure basically. Um, we've talked a little bit about how we can do synchronous execution, sort of like how Ecto works uh, using the asynchronous model. Because we've decoupled the uh, code that happens in callbacks and the execution of them, you can, you know, the naive executor just executes things that are ready, but you could, there's no reason you can't have an executor with a scheduler that knows when to execute what in what order, for example. Um, and more efficient package resource management was something Dirk talked about. So with that, I'm gonna yield the rest of the time so we can have plenty of questions. Yeah, so um, uh, so the question was how are we gonna handle exception handling in uh, nodes that share a single process? So that's a notorious problem and one of the main reasons that ROS1 was developed where every node was its own process was fault isolation. Um, so when it's something like a seg fault or something like that, there's not a lot we can do about it um, typically. Uh, and so the, the idea there is that we make it so easy to run processes either in their own process or together, that when you do have a problem like that, you just split everybody into separate processes, figure out who had the problem, and then once you've fixed it, you can put them back together again. So like, just raising exceptions. Yeah, so, um, I don't know, honestly, I haven't given a lot of thought to that. I, I don't know what the other guys think, but most likely, uh, we, we, we can do something to prevent uh, exceptions in, in one node from preventing uh, the continued execution of no other nodes in the same process. Um, I'm not sure how nodelets handle uh, exceptions, actually. I think, I think 
I think even the Roth one case could be smarter and not like destroy everything when one of the nodes nodelets like throws raises an exception. Um, just catching that one, giving you the error message, but continue would probably be the smarter way. But that would also be possible in Roth one. I just. <laughs> yes, no, but um, the nodelet management manager could actually catch like any exceptions, but nobody implemented that. <laughs> Pull request are welcome. <laughs> That, that was the other thing I was going to say before I, we get distracted is that with the lifecycle management, we can, we can do, we have a, we'll probably have a recovery state for exceptions, normal exceptions. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so, so I didn't enter, so the summary of the question was, uh, we talked about briefly, we mentioned the idea that we could do, uh, because we've decoupled the callbacks and the execution model, that we could do executors with schedulers, and then the question was, will the schedulers have options of like what kind of synchronization method, method you use? Um, the short answer is yes. So the, the concept I didn't introduce here is a concept of an executor. And so under the hood in all of these examples is this executor class, which you can register nodes with and then call different, and there's uh, and then call a basically spin on it. And there's different kinds of executors and you can implement your own executor that does just absolutely anything. Uh, so we may provide some out of the box, but at the very least we're trying to design it in a way that if you want to do something different, that's totally possible. So the question is uh, that there's been some concern about the usability of ROS moving forward. It keeps getting more and more complicated, larger learning curve, I guess, is what, what is implied there, um, and what we're going to try to do about it in ROS 2. Um, I guess the best explanation I can have is that we're not going to, well, the first thing is to not make it worse. So we're trying to minimize the number of concepts that you have to know in order to get started in ROS. And so to that end, callback groups are optional, executors are optional, there's new features that are in some ways represented in ROS1 but most people don't know about. Um, in terms of improving the usability, I think one of the things we can do is that there are a lot of things in ROS1 that were added after the initial design which caused them to be more complicated than they have to be. A good example of this is dynamic reconfigure. So by, simp by making some things that people commonly find useful that are currently tacked on top into first class citizens, we can make things simpler. Um, yeah, actions, for example, actions will be a first class citizen instead of something implemented on top. Um, I don't know if that answers everything. The question is, um, given the limited resources we have, how do we intend to uh, rally the community to, uh, to work on basically porting stuff from ROS1 to ROS2? Is that essentially the question? Um, so uh, I guess my thought on this is that, uh, you know, with or without us, ROS1 and ROS2 don't succeed. It requires that people in the community are invested in these ideas and they're willing to spend time on it. Um, the, the best thing we can do, in my opinion, is provide these core technologies and the infrastructure from in which the community can operate. And in terms of what we're gonna do to try to drive uh, people into using ROS2 and moving stuff, is we wanna demonstrate that ROS2 is worth their time and better. Uh, I don't know if any other people have other, other feedback. Uh, and, and, and as William showed in the examples, besides having the new client library with an API where we think that's how we imagine it to be, there will very likely be probably a, a secondary API which strives to be like as close as possible to ROS1 to if you want to do the transition that it will be like 
as uh, smooth as possible. Minimal effort. Yeah. So, yeah. So I guess I guess the Catkin uh, rollout is it made us a little bit uh, disruption adverse. So that's why we chose. I think personally, that's why we chose to do ROS two is like a separate but equal project until it's mature enough. Because just continuously disrupting the ROS one system by incrementally putting these improvements in, I think would be really disruptive. So mm -hmm. I, I think that people being able to choose when they think ROS two is mature enough and move over all at once is better than just iteratively rolling out things in ROS1. Yeah, so the question is, uh, we mentioned that there will be a C API for ROS uh, too, uh, and what does that mean for the client libraries? Are they gonna be native or wrapping bindings of that? Uh, I guess my, uh, my intention with the C API is that it, it gives you the choice. So um, the first thing you'll need if you wanna do a native implementation will be a DDS implementation. Now there exists DDS implementations for many other languages other than C and C++, uh, mostly Java and C Sharp. So if you choose to go that way, you can. Uh, but I think the C API is just another option. And I think probably Rospio will use, will wrap as bindings the C API uh, simply because it minimizes the amount of duplication of effort for us because we'll probably maintain both of them and it'll produce a more consistent result between Python and C++. Um, but again, I think it, you know, there are pros and cons to doing a native versus wrapping bindings. Uh, so I think it'll be up to the people developing that and their preference. The question is, um, we mentioned that DDS does not need a master to do discovery, and what does that imply with multi-master, multi-robot situations? Is that correct? Okay. Um, so basically, uh, I think what that means for us is that we have a whole lot of new features that DDS has to try to support this. In fact, um, talking with the DDS companies, they when we talked about them with the multi-robot situation, and they have their own ideas about how DDS could service that need. Uh, and we will probably try to figure out which ones of those capabilities are most important for that and expose it through the ROS API. But in my mind, the multi-robot situation is, is, uh, is that it hasn't been, there's no like silver bullet that we've discovered for that. And depending on your use case, uh, there's different best solutions. So I think the best thing we can do is make the stuff you would use to implement those solutions as flexible as possible. So like, Eugen has been working pretty hard to do a multi-robot system on ROS1, and there are just some fundamental parts about the way the, the ROS1 uh, middleware works that makes it difficult for them to accomplish that. And I just, I think the best thing we can do, rather than deciding on this is the best way to do it, so it's the way we're gonna do it, is to just give everybody the tools they need to do it the way they think's best. Um, that being said, I think if we, if we can decide on a good, reasonable default way to do multi-robot multi systems, we can add constructs for that. So, uh, well, yeah, so DDS has features like partitions. Yeah, which, which one? Uh, the purple shirt. How would uh, you push in or DDS affect uh, ROS APIs? The question is, how will DDS encryption uh, affect uh, ROS APIs? Um, the answer is, I don't know. Uh, my naive assumption is, is that you can write ROS code agnostic to whether it's being sent over encrypted channels, and that's like a global configuration for your DDS implementation. Um, but I don't know, honestly. I don't know. So, so even our prototype currently does not support, obviously, all the features of DDS because we just didn't have the use cases yet. But even without uh, specific for support for certain quality of service parameters, usually you can con configure them in the vendor-specific way. So I could imagine that we could run our talk and listen example and use, if it's using RTI, for example, uh, change the configuration of Connex in a way that it does use encryption or authorization and authentication, um, which is then transparent to our high level API. Uh, I have a question. If uh, DDS is so awesome and it's standard, why don't we just move it directly? Why do we need all this stuff to describe? 
The question is, if DDS is so amazing and awesome, why do we need ROS API on top of it? And the answer is, is that uh, the DDS API is vast and complicated. And um, I think this is one of the main reasons that it hasn't got a large adoption in universities and hobbyists is because, one, it's difficult uh, to get, until recently, in the last, like, last two years, it's been difficult to get a good reference implementation that's open source. And, uh, and the other part is that it's complicated. And when you first look at it, you think it's unnecessarily complicated, but as you continue to use it, you realize that all the pieces have a purpose. It's just that most of those purposes are very narrow corner cases that we don't need to support. So we put our API on top to make it easy to get into and easier for novice programmers and uh, expose some of the functionality that they provide to power users in a different way. So the question is, uh, do we plan to add things to ROS2 to make development of UI interfaces for robots easier? And particularly, I think you imagine user interfaces and not developer user interfaces, like developer tools? Well, I mean, like consumer. consumer interfaces. Um, I don't think we have any plans to do that currently. I mean, we could potentially. Uh, it's just not on my scope right now. I think there's a need for that eventually, but you know, that's one of those final polishing things you do after you have the core tools, the developer tools, and the like robot components, default robot components. Um, so I, I'm not sure, I guess. I don't know if other people have another one. So, so the question is, um, uh, is there going to be, uh, he basically plus one the idea of a ROS1, headers that implement the ROS1 API built on top of the ROS2 implementation, uh, and maybe automatic code conversion in order to support the uh, Herculean effort to convert like all the packages in Indigo to ROS2. So uh, I think we'll do whatever makes sense. If the APIs are close enough, we could do some kind of automation tool. Like, like I said, the example I showed, it's actually really trivial to convert the ROS1 in an example. You basically move the node name to the construction of the node and pass the node to spin. It's really straightforward. Um, but even that could be challenging to automate. Uh, I don't know, it's something we can look into. For the ROS1 API headers, uh, I think it's totally possible to do that. My concern is, is that it will work, but not as you expect. Like they'll like, like the APIs match and the ideas match, but the topics may behave differently. And for simple programs, that may be totally fine. But for more complicated things like move base or the RVIS, you're probably almost guaranteed to run into qualitative issues that don't line up. <laughs> TF all over again? Like all the documentation for TF one, so like Ah, yes. Yeah. So it's true. All right. Let's all right. Is that it?